In Brockton, we swing for the fences so we can touch home. We coach in Brockton to instill the teamwork that builds a great winning tradition. We do business in Brockton because here you can find a taste of home away from home. We keep our company in Brockton because we love this city. When Brockton is home, everything is within reach. Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, personally welcome all of you to Brockton City Hall for today's uh, 78th uh, remembrance ceremony of the 13 firefighters that were lost. And I also want to make sure that I personally welcome both Chief Francis and Chief Galligan. It's an honor to have both of you back here at City Hall also. March 10th, 1941, 13 firefighters went to work and never returned home to see their families. It's an important day in the history of this city for a lot of reasons. And I believe that today we're here to remember and memorialize the 13 fallen firefighters. But I think there's also a lot more to the, the story and the history of the Strand Theater Fire. Um, I think that, first of all, it reminds us the risk all of our first responders take uh, when they report to work. Uh, they take on the responsibility of protecting us. Uh, we need to assume the responsibility of making sure they get back to their families at the end of every shift. When you think about March 10th, 1941, I think that day speaks to not just the heroism that was exhibited by so many, but also the resiliency of this city and how the people of this city, the Brockton Fire Department's resiliency, but also the resiliency of the city, how many were impacted. Um, 20 firefighters seriously injured, about 35 injured, I think, altogether, over 20 seriously, in addition to the 13 lives lost. The impacts on all of those families of their loved ones uh, thinking about what the scene looked like out here uh, that evening and you know, picturing the insurance agency next door being essentially converted into, I guess what we would call rehab today, a place for the firefighters to go and get a little respite before going back to join the fight again. Um, the police station that was right next door and nearby was turned into a first aid station providing uh, medical aid to those who were being brought out of the fire scene. Picturing all the physicians in the city all rushing to this makeshift first aid station at the police station to provide medical assistance. And thinking about the response of the city even in the days and weeks and months and years afterwards, say, I read it being described as walking down Main Street a couple days after the fire and literally every storefront having set up some type of memorial in their window uh, in, in memory of the firefighters that had been lost. So I think that the way the department rebounded, the, the courage that was shown, you know, I think we know so much more today than they knew back in 1941. And they only count those with the physical injuries as being injured. But I think today, knowing what we know about PTSD and the impact that an event like this has on those there, you know, I know that there were a lot more who were injured and scarred on the inside uh, from having lived through the experience. 
those that were rescued out, those who went back in looking for their brother firefighters, uh, even the, the local laborers, local building trade local, pulled a bunch of guys together to go in and help look for the lost and the survivors. Um, and so we know that you know, the impact was far reaching and went on for a long time. And it's, it's, it's an important part of the fabric of this city that we gather every year on or about March 10th to remember what happened. To this day, still one of the largest loss of life in a building fire. And remember those that were lost, but also remember the price that was paid by so many, the way this city came together to rally around its fire department, and how today, I know the job has changed quite a bit since 1941. Um, certainly, you know, I don't think in 1941 they really talked about um, carcinogens and um, all the other risks that firefighters take when they enter any type of a scene. Uh, but the bottom line is providing safety and security for the city, responding when needed, and saving lives, whether it's saving lives at an accident scene, a fire scene, an overdose victim, but continuing to be out on the streets of the city 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, saving lives. and. Uh, from where I get to sit uh, nowadays as mayor, uh, I, I have a seat in the front row, and uh, I never cease to be amazed by the professionalism and the heroism that is exhibited by our firefighters and all of our first responders on a daily basis. And most people never get to see most of the great work that they do uh, at great risk to themselves. But I think today is a day for us to remember that uh, and honor that, and for me to show my appreciation for what this fire department means to our city. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you in DC this morning. I first want to th thank you all so much for the invitation, Mr. President, uh, Ed Kelly, General Secretary and Treasurer, a Massachusetts guy, uh, Jay Colbert, our third district president, and I have to be sure to mention our president of Local 144, Bill Hill. It's meaningful that I stand before this group today one day after the 78th anniversary of the Strand Theater fire in Brockton. On March 10th, 1941, in Brockton, Massachusetts, 13 firefighters responded to the Strand Theater fire but never returned home to their families. The impact was felt not just by the department, but by our entire city. And to this day, it remains one of the largest loss of firefighters' lives in a building fire collapse. That tragedy is woven into the fabric of who we are as a city. It's a story of heroism and resiliency the heroism of all of the firefighters at that scene that night, but also the resiliency, not just of our fire department, but our entire city in the aftermath of that tragedy. 78 years later, not only do we still remember, but we are reminded of the risk that our firefighters take every time they report to work. Mayors, have a truly unique relationship with their fire department. Unlike legislators and other elected officials, we're standing right behind you on the front lines. And while a mayor's most important responsibility may be to provide for the public safety, we also have the same responsibility to get every firefighter and every first responder home safely to their family at the end of their shift. As mayor, I've gained tremendous respect and appreciation for the work that's done on a daily basis by our professional firefighters. That respect was further magnified when I had the opportunity to participate in the Fire Ops 101 drills last summer during the US Conference of Mayors. I don't think I could have ever imagined how difficult it could be 
to work and operate wearing full protective gear, or how easily you can become disoriented once inside. And I also got a great sense firsthand of how much you all rely on each other. Enlisting me to participate in that Fire Ops 101 drill may have been some of the best negotiating that our local 144 has ever done. I didn't even have the gear off yet when I told our two union reps that we needed to go out and get that new lighter weight breathing apparatus as soon as possible. <laughs> and if I know Bill and Archie, they made sure I had the heaviest one available the day that I was there. In our city, my relationship with our firefighters is based upon mutual respect, mutual trust, and a recognition that we share common goals. And at the core of that relationship is the sanctity of the collective bargaining process. In the city of Brockton, we have 13 different collective bargaining units. That means 13 separate collective bargaining agreements. When I took office in January of 2014, 12 of the 13 bargaining units were out of contract, some of them two or three years out of contract. But in June of 2018, we had all 13 city bargaining units currently under a contract in just four years. We as a city are committed to the collective bargaining process. So as all you reps know, collective bargaining is tough. It's hard work. Sometimes we even get mad at each other, as hard as that is to believe. And by the way, I haven't always enjoyed the support of IAFF Local 144. In 2013, in my first campaign, I challenged a two-term incumbent. Local 144 supported the incumbent. They were loyal to the mayor, and I understood that, and I respected that. In my two re-election campaigns since, I have enjoyed the support of Local 144. And now having campaigned with the firefighters against me, and having then running with the firefighters for me, I like it a lot better when you're for me. <laughs> successful collective bargaining is not about who wins. When collective bargaining is successful, everyone wins. Our firefighters realize that their collectively bargained rights and benefits protect both them and their families, while the residents know that they are safer in a community served by a professional fire department. Through collective bargaining, we're able to take on challenges that face both our city and our fire department. Two years ago, we successfully negotiated a drug testing policy with our fire department. Not arbitration, not a court decision, but an actual collectively bargained policy. And that policy is built upon a compassionate response with the goal of getting our employee well and returned to duty as soon as possible. Our policy protects firefighters' rights, but at the same time allows the department, through the chief, to address a firefighter that may be struggling with a substance use disorder. We realize that our firefighters have families that we need to protect and keep together, while at the same time protecting the safety of that firefighter's brothers and sisters working in the same company. And I know that we have a lot of union representatives here, so please rest assured that we paid for the language. At the collective bargaining table, the city and the firefighters union working together have been able to provide improved health and welfare benefits to firefighters. Today we realize that a firefighter's health includes behavioral health. And together we've made great strides in recognizing the impact of PTSD on our firefighters. And you know that far better than I. That in this job you respond to a lot of things that can be tough to get out of your head. As a city, we partnered with our Attorney General in the Home Base Program to provide training to identify signs of PTSD 
while working to remove the stigma of seeking assistance. It's important for our firefighters to have the resources to take care of each other. We're also aware that a high percentage of our firefighters are veterans who may be carrying unseen wounds of war. And while I do believe very strongly in the sanctity of our collective bargaining process, I believe that for collective bargaining to be successful, there has to be trust built between both partners. A couple of quick examples. About two months after becoming mayor in 2014, our city was hit with a huge spike up in overdose deaths. I asked our firefighters to begin carrying Narcan or Naloxone. Now while our local 144 could have held up the deployment of Narcan by forcing impact bargaining, they didn't. They believed it was more important to their mission of saving lives that they have naloxone in their first aid kit. And I never forgot that. And in case I may have, our local 144 union president at the time, Archie Gormley, told me that he would be sure to remind me during the next round of contract negotiations. <laughs> Later that year, we were able to obtain new dental coverage that was far superior to the old plan at the same cost. Well, instead of holding off on the new plan for the next contract negotiations, I decided to implement it immediately without asking the union for anything in return because our families needed that coverage and because it was the right thing to do. Our professional firefighters are committed to ongoing training. In recent months, I've witnessed our Brockton professional firefighters training in the proper use of their new SCBA breathing apparatus, participating in active shooter drills, and participating in cold water rescues. I can think of no better example of preparedness training than this past November, when just days after training with other first responders to a simulated bus accident, Brockton firefighters were called upon to extricate a transit bus driver trapped in the wreckage of her crashed vehicle. Picture a dozen firefighters in and on that crashed bus, most working to untangle the wreckage to free the driver, others providing first aid to stabilize the driver, while one firefighter held that driver's hand throughout the entire ordeal, providing emotional comfort and support. There is no doubt in my mind that the simulated training completed just days earlier fully prepared our professional firefighters to respond more quickly and effectively, saving that bus driver's life. Recently, Brockton became one of a number of communities implementing a change, to, change in response strategy for an active shooter situation. Currently, most police departments Strategy is solely on taking out the actual shooter before, before providing any medical assistance to victims. And I think through experience, unfortunately, we've come to realize that many of these victims are bleeding out while we're still in the process of going to get the shooter. Now, under our new strategy, the first wave of police are still going after the shooter. However, the secondary response is to now have police escorting firefighters into warm zones to provide immediate first aid and extricate victims quickly into an ambulance. In their new role, our firefighters are wearing ballistic equipment in order to assist victims prior to the shooter being neutralized. And unlike many other communities, we agreed to impact bargain this change in working conditions resulting in an increase in hazard pay for Brockton firefighters. So I'd like to leave you with a personal story of a fire scene as seen through the eyes of a mayor. I, I probably look at things through a little different lens than you do. So about two years ago, I'm riding in my car and I had the scanner on, as I usually do, and I heard a call for a fire in a nearby apartment building with flames showing out of the building. So going directly to the scene, I arrived just probably within 
a minute or less of when the first fire company got there. What I saw was the ladder pull up, a second story balcony apartment with flames shooting out right over the head of an elderly gentleman on the balcony who was screaming for help. The firefighters, not even taking the time to deploy the ladder, grabbed an aluminum ladder on the truck, whatever we call that, hand ladder. Ground ladder, thank you. Grabbed the ground ladder, ran to the balcony. Three of the firefighters in full gear, big guys with a lot of gear, went up that ladder. Two of them went over the edge of the balcony, pulled the gentleman out. The third firefighter carried him down the ladder, and they got him into an ambulance. It was one of the most incredible things I've ever had the chance to see. The two of those firefighters, the two firefighters that went over the railing, were both burned. Fortunately, not too severely, but they were transported to the hospital. And to really what stood out to me in terms of the professionalism and training of the firefighters is that one of those firefighters was the son of the deputy chief who was com in command of the fire scene at that time. And that fire chief, Deputy Chief Davis, never blinked, never did anything differently, was in complete control of that fire scene at all times. And I'll never forget that. He had his job to do, he did it, he executed it with full knowledge that one of those ambulances was carrying his son to the hospital. As a mayor, I respect your professionalism, I honor your courage, and I, and I appreciate what a professional fire department means to the safety of our residents. Thank you. They're pushing it because I've come by two different nights and seen it flash. This first location of a rapidly flashing beacon is here on North Montello Street at the corner of Wilmington. Uh, very busy spot for commuters getting on and off of the commuter, uh, off of commuter rail to be crossing Route 28 North Montello Street here. So I'm sure that that had to be a big factor in selecting this as one of the locations, targeting areas where this type of pedestrian safety improvement would have the most impact. Right, when we met with the uh, task force, with the train station being so close to North Montello Street, you, you will find a lot of pedestrian traffic crossing here, so this is one of the target locations. Yep. And particularly at this time of year, I know that we get a lot of early morning and later evening commuters that are actually the going to work or coming home from work in the dock now at this time of the year, and crossing this street can be problematic uh, in the dock. So. These are the rapidly uh, flashing beacons. We're going to actually look at four sets of them that have been installed. But just kind of give me a general overview in terms of the power, the signage, and sure. exactly how they work. So the intention of the RRFB, rapid, uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacon, is only to give attention to a passing motorist that is a pedestrian waiting to walk. So this isn't a stoplight. Uh, it's not a red light. This is just to gain the attention of a driver who might not see someone in the dark attempting to cross the street. Right. Uh, it's solar powered. As you can see the solar power up top. Yep. The wiring comes down through the pipe into this box. Inside the box, there's a, a battery about the size of a car battery. Uh, there's wiring terminals and there's a computer that's about twice the size of uh, an iPhone. It's not a very big computer whatsoever. Okay. Uh, when someone comes up to push the button, it's just a touch button. You don't have to push it in or anything. Okay. Once you touch it, you'll get a uh, tone that acknowledges that you've touched the button. Yeah. The beacons will begin to flash. Now, in addition to this project, there were improvements done to the pedestrian access to make sure that the ramps were good. 
Yep. And there was an additional signage. You can see about 100 feet up. Yep. Uh, facing the other direction, there's a uh, so pedestrian we'll, ahead sign. We'll get a shot of that. So a big, right. a big part of these safety improvements at these crossing points, it's not just the beacons, but it's the signage. And you can see the difference. And I've driven by these a number of times now. The signage here and the signage on both sides of the street. I mean, they are really bright fluorescent. Right. You see them in your car approaching. You see them from quite a distance. And when you add that to the flashing lights, but yeah, so the, there's signage that's already going to be warning the driver about a pedestrian crossing. And then if in fact someone's getting ready to cross, they hit the button, the flashing lights are going to gain the driver's attention, hopefully in plenty of time for them to stop and allow the pedestrian to cross. Right, and they find that the, some of the biggest causes uh, of pedestrian accidents is the distracted driver. And hopefully the rapid flashing beacon will get the attention of the distracted driver. Right, so, so if that driver who may not be paying attention or may not be aware right. that they're approaching a popular pedestrian crossing between the signage, the flashing lights, it's going to catch their attention. Hopefully they at least take their foot off the gas and slow down a little bit to look to see right. what might be there. So the flashing beacon, it's not a stop sign. It doesn't require a driver to come to a stop. It's designed to make the driver aware that there may be someone getting ready to cross the street right through their path. That's correct. Uh, it's also important to remember that you need to use the crosswalk. And as the pedestrian, this is not a stoplight. Right. So when you push the button, you still have to stand in the crosswalk and look both ways and wait for a safe passage. Right. So you don't, you don't have the benefit of a traffic signal. And actually, these are designed to go at locations that don't have traffic Correct. signals, right? So we're going to tend to find these at busy intersections and busy spots that are not con currently controlled by a traffic light. Correct. And with the solar power, no hard wiring involved. Nope. It will, it'll store enough no, juice uh, from the sunny days. Right. There's no electrical power to this besides what's uh, in the um, solar. And the battery is, is rated to last a few days, uh, even without any solar. Yep. Uh, they are connected by radio. <coughs> so when one button is pushed, both will activate. So you'll have flashing on both sides of the street yep. at the same, same time. And that's radio controls. And actually, if we look at that one across the street, I think particularly maybe from up here, you can get a much clearer idea of what that solar panel looks like. And uh, I guess facing the south, because that's where the track of the sun is. Right. All right, do you think we can... Uh, so if we push the button, when we push it, we will get a red light, a little red light, a little LED here. Yep. And we will get a, uh, an audible tone, just a small chirp that yep. acknowledges. All right, so let's give it a try here and see what it looks like when a pedestrian activates it. So you get the small chirp. Yep. It's flashing. The lights are flashing. So now we walk. But still have to look both ways. So they see us. And that, right, now they've stopped and let us cross. Wow, that worked great. It's still flashing, so still plenty of time. Yep. Um, so the key is the light doesn't require the driver to stop. The light doesn't require the driver to stop, but hopefully by drawing attention to it, the driver now sees the person in the crosswalk and comes to the stop to allow them to cross. Great. Yeah. Now I've got to tell folks, and maybe we can get a shot of this after dark, but I've come by here a couple times at night. And I mean, there is a dramatic difference in how visible those beacons are at night. When you're coming down this street at night and that beacon's flashing, you can see it from a long, long distance. It's drawing your attention. And it almost reminds you of a railroad crossing. It's right. like approaching a railroad crossing. Kind of the same idea, except uh, for a pedestrian crossing. Right. All right, we'll take our chances and try going back again. Okay. So you can hear when you push the button, yep. We'll still these have are, to stop and look. Yep. These are new handicap accessible ramps on each side of the crosswalk also. So, so this person's not familiar. So you get, yep. you've got to look. Got to look. Oh, we're good now. And I think it's important to note that part of this project required by law was uh, making sure that uh, this intersection was fully ADA compliant. Right. So another benefit, and it did take a little away from some of the pedestrians, the extent of some of the equipment we could purchase, but in terms of us moving towards complete streets right. and, and accessibility, we've not only redone the crosswalks and put this equipment in, but we've now also ensured that uh, someone in a wheelchair can cross safely also. Right.